Hello, welcome back to Decaf Map, and welcome if you are new here. So, I thought that we could review and practice the concept of the domain of a function. Domain. Of a function. And in short, we're just trying to find the set of possible um, inputs. And um, I guess first we need to review the concept of a function and how they work. So basically, you can think of functions either as, um, like, a set of instructions for what to do for, let's say, a specific input. So I'm just going to use x as a placeholder, um, so I'm going to give it an input, x, and then my function is sort of like the set of instructions for what to do to give you a corresponding output. So I'll call that Y. And as long as my set of instructions are produce a um, single output for each input. So for instance, if I inputted, you know, value 1 into my function, I shouldn't sometimes get 3 and sometimes get 5. I should have a clear output for each input that I put in, okay? So my function might look something like, you know, I'm going to multiply that input by 5 and then add 2. Something like that. So this kind of represents a set of instructions so that if I input 1, my corresponding output would be 5 times 1 plus 2. Of course, we have to uh, keep track of order of operations here. But this is one way to represent a function um, where, you know, y, which is my output, is f of x. And this is how you can represent it if you kind of have infinitely many possible inputs and you want to describe the relationship between x and y in this way. So that, you know, I can input negative 10, I can input a million, and you want to always have this sort of pattern going. But we can also have you know, you can also kind of think of functions as the actual set of pairings between input and output. And in this case, it would be like an infinite set because you have just so many inputs. You could input negative 0 0.002. You could input pi or e, right? But there are some times where you can have like a finite function where you can think of functions as the actual set of inputs and outputs. So for instance, I could just pair capital letters with lowercase letters, like that as an in input and output, where my function would basically take um, and like this specific set, but I'll take these inputs A, B, C dot 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 to Z. So I'm just talking about the uh, 26 letters that we have in the English language. Um, like that. And so my inputs would be, assuming this input output pattern, my inputs would be capital letters and my outputs would be the lowercase version of them. 
So this would just be like a finite set and a finite representation of my function. It just pairs them together. So in both cases here, um, we can find the domain. Um, for the finite cases, it's actually just much easier because we're talking about possible inputs It's the set of possible inputs, but we have to be clear about what possible means. So for one, in this case, for the finite one, it's a little bit easier because you're literally taking in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, to Z capitalized as inputs. So the domain is your set of possible inputs. So it would look like A, B, C, D, E, da, 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 to Z. That is your domain for this finite situation, okay? But of course, in math, when we're working with functions like this, we need to think about how to actually think about possible inputs for stuff like this. Um, and the reason we won't write it out directly like this with the pairings is because, like we said, there's just infinitely many things you can input. So you can't possibly write them all out. It's infinite. So, um, but that's okay. We just kind of need to look at some patterns and what it means to have possible inputs now. So we can, in this particular case, have infinitely many. It's just you can pick literally anything you want. But either you have a concrete set that tells you of possible values, or you need to consider the case where our inputs kind of just break the map. We, of course, don't want to break math. We want to be giving possible inputs, um, except for the ones that make the function undefined, okay? So that's really what we're focusing on for these kinds of functions. So let's start with something like this. Anytime we actually have a polynomial, okay? which is, you can, you might see it like with the coefficients written um, in different orders than this, but you basically have x to the n minus 1 plus the idea is you have um, like coefficient, so an is a coefficient, so let's say, you know, negative 6x to the 6th plus 3x to the 5th um, plus dot 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 x to the, you know, 4th, and some of these coefficients might be 0, so any linear combination of these is fine, okay? So anytime you have, like, stuff with stuff times x to the something or any combination of those, or maybe they all go away, and they're all zero, and just f of x equals six, or something that's like a constant function. But whatever the case may be, for all of these, the input, which is the domain, or the set of all possible inputs, is just negative infinity to infinity. We like those because you can literally plug in anything. And this is the notation we use. The um, brackets here are going to be open-ended parentheses uh, because it represents from this to this. So, from to. And whether it's open means not inclusive and closed brackets like that means including the endpoints, including 
end points. Okay. So, in this case, since we're talking about negative infinity to infinity, those aren't numbers, right? So, this is the interval, which is a set of numbers. So, set of all numbers from negative infinity, so infinitely negative, to positive infinity, which literally means the set of all real numbers. So, um, we can also write it as this. Sorry, there's like a lot of noise, I had to cut that out, but, um, we're talking about all real numbers, okay? And I suppose, in theory, we could actually input, um, complex numbers as well, but we're gonna stick with the real numbers here, okay? So, all real numbers from here to here. And so this is usually the most common way of writing it. Okay. So, for any polynomial, meaning 5x plus 2, negative 3x squared plus 2x, any linear combination of coefficients and, and you know, x to the power of something, you've got this negative infinity to infinity. So we're good there. The, any other situation where you have stuff going on, like, you know, I mean, there's just so many different kinds of functions, e to the x, or, um, you know, you might have your trig functions, like sine x, or tangent x, or something. Um, we have to do this kind of analysis independently. So we th have to think of values that kind of make the whole thing undefined. So, one common place to start is um, for situations where you have some sort of denominator. So, this would be like a classic example of where if it's not, I mean, I would, I like to think of the default being negative infinity to infinity. Like, Let's allow everything, and then if certain things kind of break the math, let's exclude those one at a time. So, by default, just stick with this. <laughs> but, if, for instance, let's just start with the most basic case, f of x equals 1 over x. So, let's say this is our function. Now, what are possible inputs? Right? What are possible inputs? Well, we can let x be anything. I can plug in negative 5. I can plug in, you know, 2.33 and just do 1 over that to get a corresponding output. So that's all good. So we can start with negative infinity to infinity, just allowing everything. But if I look at this, since x is in the bottom, we know that math breaks if we tried to divide by zero. <laughs> so, this bottom part can't be zero. Cannot be zero. Because if x were zero, one over zero is undefined. So, we kind of need to do this and then kind of accept zero. And there's a better way of writing that, which is to do negative infinity to zero, which is the interval from negative infinity to up to zero, right? From this to this, and then and, which is my union, zero to infinity. And then having these open parentheses like this means I'm not including zero. So, that's how we would write out the set of possible x values that kind of don't break this. It's basically all real numbers except zero. And in order to show the except zero, 
is we have these open parentheses so that combining these two intervals um, is basically any number, but since the zero part here is open, we're not including zero itself. Does that make sense? I hope so. So, this is one classic example where x is in the denominator. And as you might imagine, um, we can put more complicated stuff down here, but we'd have to think about the same thing. So, we might need to do stuff like factoring. So, like, um, you know, like that or something. And so, there are situations and values for this. Uh, where this bottom thing makes it zero, so we'd have to solve for the x values, and we can do this in another video. We can definitely, um, kind of extrapolate from here, okay? But we can find those x values that are not allowed, and create these little intervals and union tape them together, okay? Cool. So, another sort of common theme for when math breaks is actually for square root functions. So, for right now, I'm focusing on what's called the parent function, so the basic, um, you know, sort of pattern here, but, like, this is sort of, a, the next layer of this parent function, it kind of has this, um, this isn't even totally the parent function, but it's sort of the same general, uh, you know, like, idea. It's just like one over stuff. This isn't really a parent function, I don't know, but, um, but you know what I mean? Like, we have one over stuff, one over stuff, so you can kind of pretend this is one thing. But then we have to combine that concept with factoring and whatnot, so... For this, I'm going to talk about square root of stuff. And so if we happen to have, you know, a problem where it has other stuff inside, like, you know, um, x squared minus uh, x plus or minus 6 or something like that, where we also have to factor, we can kind of extrapolate what we're doing. And we'll definitely do more examples of this soon. So, um, I just kind of wanted to mention this, but for the domain of this, remember, the idea of not breaking the math <laughs> still applies here. So, possible inputs where I don't break the math. So, let's just do, let's just do this example. And then we'll do a more complicated one as examples, um, and just jump straight into the examples in a future video. But for the square root part, it's just what are my set of possible inputs? So again, let's just by default sort of assume all real numbers. But what breaks the math here? Well, the thing is, if we are sticking within the set of all real numbers, okay, so we're talking about the real realm here, we can't input a negative number because what is the square root of negative 5? Well, that's where we have to get into imaginary numbers, but, you know, for the sake of real numbers, that is undefined. So, I can't input negative 5, I can't input anything negative for that matter. Can I input 0? Yes, right? Because the square root of 0 is 0. So I can input anything that is non-negative, or rather, 0 or more. And that's how we would write that. 0 inclusive to infinity, meaning anything more that way. So... That's the domain of f of x equals square root of x. 
and then again for this kind of situation you kind of you can you can extrapolate from what we did here but you just need to now solve this inequality for x squared minus x minus 6 being greater or equal to 0 and you have to find what x values satisfy this because if you input some sort of x in this where x squared minus x minus 6 evaluates to something that is less than zero, you have broken the math. It's outside of what's allowed for under the square root. So if you're trying to find the domain of this, um, you have to consider when that whole thing is going to be greater or equal to zero. Okay, which then you have to do a little bit more work. But um, those are two classic examples. So one will be if you have stuff on the denominator, you uh, want to solve when that is equal to zero so that you don't divide by zero. And those are the values that you want to exclude. And then for square roots, you want to make sure the stuff under the square root is greater or equal to zero. And then there's other stuff like working with trig functions, you know, it's actually sort of a variation of this, but so if you have, say, like, secant of x, what is the domain of f of x equals secant of x? This is kind of a variation of the 1 over x thing because secant is 1 over cosine of x, if you've learned trig. Um, but this is by definition 1 over cosine of x, so as long as cosine of x, that thing in the denominator, is not equal to 0, then we can allow anything. We can allow any angle, right? Any value as long as this is not equal to 0, which coincidentally is, uh, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 and um, any multiple of pi from there, right? So, um, because you can keep going around the unit circle, but anyways, um, but just giving you an idea there. Um, for the most part, these two are the most common, like, break math situations. Um, yeah, and other stuff might come up with, like, uh, trig functions and inverse trig functions and stuff like that. And of course you have to kind of tailor this based on whatever you're given, but conceptually finding the domain of a function is basically playing around with what values um, kind of make the function undefined and to include all the other values and then excluding that. So it's just kind of getting the hang of using this notation. I always have the open parentheses around infinity and negative infinity. Keep the open parentheses if you're not including the um, if you're not including a particular endpoint, and close parentheses if you are. And uh, union. I'm just getting used to that. So we'll do more examples of this. Um, Maybe we'll even work through these two particular ones, but I wanted to just kind of have a chill hangout session and to just kind of show you what's up. Um, let me know if you have any suggestions or topic requests or anything. Um, like I said, we'll work through, we'll just jump right in and do some practice problems, but, um, just wanted to take this step by step. Hope this wasn't too, too rambly, and if nothing else, maybe just relaxing. Um, I hope that you're doing very well. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you for more math soon. Bye!